Hey listeners, today's episode is brought to you by eBay. If you want to learn more now, go to ebay.com backslash EIS. Again, that's ebay.com slash EIS. All right, now enjoy the show. Diana, Christine, so tell me, what's your go-to office lunch? If I'm buying? Yeah, just like I, whatever. I will take something from home and sadly put it in a plate and try to eat it at my lunch while I'm typing away. That's good. Yeah. How many days a week do you remember your lunch? Because I feel like I make my lunch and then I just leave it sitting on my counter oh my, at home. That's exactly what I yeah. did today. Oh. I forgot my lunch. So I didn't eat lunch and then you reminded me to eat lunch. I'm hangry. <laughs> Let's have steak and lobster. <laughs> This is From the Ground Up. I'm Inc. Executive Editor, Diana Ransom. And I'm Editor-at-Large, Christine Ligorio chafkin Today's episode, Scaling the Office Lunch. So, Christine, for today's episode, I spoke with Dilip Rao, who's the founder and CEO of a company called ShareBite. Have you heard of ShareBite? I have heard of ShareBite, um, mostly because you wrote about ShareBite for our Inc. 5000 issue. That's right. They were number 56 on this year's list. So, And they grew their three-year revenue by some gargantuan amount of money. Their revenue growth was about uh, four th- over 4,000% over three years. So doing gangbusters. But yeah, so ShareBite, what they do is uh, it, they do basically like your standard corporate food ordering platform. But they've also, they've mixed in an HR element so that it's basically like if you could think of your lunch every day as a benefit. Oh, uh, like, like healthcare. Yeah. Or the gym membership. So how does that like how does that work if you're an employee of a company that uses ShareBite? Well, they have different kind of strategies. So one is like you would just tell the office manager, you just she sends out a link and then you you say like, okay, we're ordering from Sweet Green today. So they have they work with a number of different vendors, especially they they work with local vendors depending on where you are. So like a couple of like Nashville vendors in Nashville, sort of local places in New York City too. So you would just order, like do like a group ordering if you want. And then um, your company would subsidize a portion of that meal. So therein lies the benefit. Mm, okay. But it also, like, a, a remote worker could take advantage as well, perhaps? Yeah. It was um, – we're going to get into that okay. um, during the interview. But, you know, definitely – They've grown a lot in new ways, and that's one element that they've grown. That's amazing. So this company sort of took off, like, out of the pandemic. Um, Why are we speaking to them now? Yeah, so I've actually spoken with Dilip a couple of times. Um, You know, the first time I talked to him, I wasn't actually able to utilize one part of his story in the piece that I wrote. And it's just stuck with me. It's like the kind of thing that just kind of sticks with you, and you're like, this guy's story is so incredible. And the fact that they were on the Inc. 5000 this year was like, now here's my opportunity to tell this guy's Uh, real story. So, Okay, you have to tell us the story now. Let's let Dalib tell his story. But first, I started the conversation with him by asking how he talks to clients about food as a benefit. It depends on the customer. We segment the customers, uh, the clients, uh, so to speak, across really two different buckets, right? So one, uh, and then, you know, there's other separate buckets thereafter. But the primary bucket is, do they already have an employee meal program? Um, If they do, the decision is a bit of a no-brainer because they see our technology, they they see who else uses us, of course, they see the technology and it just kind of blows their mind that we've literally thought about everything. And then they, they look at our back end, they ask her all, all these like odd questions. And it's, it's funny to listen to these calls once in a while. And and they say, well, this is a bit of a crazy idea, but do you have this? And then it's like magic, right? Someone on our account management team says, you know, hey, Diana, go ahead and hit refresh on your browser. And it's there because we've thought about it. We've got thousands of different features uh, all all built out. So it's it's really about what you want. And we just turn it on for you. It's amazing. So what are what are the, I mean, in the realm of things that you have thought about already, you know, when I was writing the story for the Inc. 5000 issue about your company, I kind of personally went down the rabbit hole on like, can you actually, like, is this an IRS sanctioned kind of thing? Like, can food be a benefit? And is that one of the things that you have, quote unquote, thought about? Again, not allowed to offer tax advice here, so um, <laughs> I'll leave that caveat the question rarely ever comes up among our customers because they they're sophisticated enough. Most of them are large enterprises with 
large enough accounting and legal functions that they've figured it out already. So the, the question about taxation rarely ever comes up for us. Mm-hmm. It's it's more about like, do you have the feature set? Much of the conversation nowadays is is largely carried out by either HR or what's called total rewards or benefits, or uh, there's this other function known as workplace, right? Employee experience or workplace experience. Those folks tend to know this space like inside out. And so whenever our team ends up meeting uh, people among those groups, we have an honest conversation with them. And so the, the thing that's come up largely over the last few years, we're in a this high interest rate environment, even though the recent rate cut announcement, in a high rate environment, people are not willing to spend as much money. But what's been interesting is the the best companies and the best CFOs really bifurcate the outlay of cash flow between expenses and investments. They hate expenses, but they love investments. Mm -hmm. And so what's largely been happening, and we're at the forefront of it, is a conversation around benefit utilization rates. And I've learned a lot in this category too, because if you talk to HR leaders and benefits, total rewards leaders, you ask them like, what's the successful benefit that you've implemented? And, you know, with respect to utilization rates, they'll tell you, hey, if, if we have a, I don't know, seven, eight percent utilization rate, that's, that's a good, that's a successful outcome. So that's like a bit of a head scratcher to me, right? Because like, well, what, what do you mean? Well, you know, we offer the standard benefits, you know, medical, dental, and, you know, vision, et cetera. But then we have all these other benefits too. But our struggle is that it's not utilized. We're paying for it. Some of the best companies, one particular that I was recently, you know, over the summer I was at the office of in New York City, a company that I personally very much admire, they pride themselves on a gr- being a great place to work, right? Visionary founder, et cetera. And the, their chief HR officer said, hey, we have very good at utilization rate. What does that, in terms of numbers, what does that translate to? It's like, I'm 20%. Oh. <laughs> right? that's, that's pretty high in the benefits world, right? Anybody who's in the benefits total reward space listening to this will, will concur, they'll, they'll agree. Meal benefits have a 95% utilization rate, right? It literally puts every other benefit that any company offers to shame and, and, and from different, uh, different perspectives, right? Because mm-hmm. today, every company is looking at maximizing its return on invested capital. And they're also looking at the benefit, you know, bundled benefits programs where they're offering, I don't know, pet insurance. Not everybody's got a pet. And those who have a pet may not necessarily want pet insurance. Adoption benefits, nothing wrong with it. But I've worked at a lot of companies that have offered, uh, and I know a lot of companies that do offer that, not everybody adopts a child, right? Mm-hmm. It's a great offering. We ourselves used to provide our employees, I, I believe we still do, a gym subscription, right? Like a monthly, whatever. There was literally two people on our team using it. Oh, no. And so it was really this this uh, stuff that we have observed with our customers. I saw it going down in our own, in our own company because our head of finance and our head of HR on a call being like, why are we paying for this thing? There's only two people using it. <laughs> it's bundled. Right. So, but, but food, they everybody everybody can get down with food. So. Correct. Everybody eats from the lens of maximizing not only return on invested capital, but utilization rates, mm-hmm. right? You're offering a meal stipend. People are going to use it. And you can offer the meal stipend through our uh, technology for different reasons. So some of our customers say, well, you only get the meal stipend if you come into an office. Well, I wanted to ask you about that because the the time frame that we're looking at for the Inc. 5000 really centered around that era. So you have a company that largely, if not primarily, focuses on providing food for people in an office. How did you grow so much when people weren't actually in an office? When we started building ShareBite, you couldn't go to companies and say, hey, we're an employee meal benefits platform because they would have malfunctioned. What do you mean by meal benefits, (laughs) right? And so we we had to kind of take this approach, you know, X for Y, for example, right? Like um, Airbnb, right? When Airbnb initially started off, 
you had to be a, uh, hey, we're the Expedia of short-term rentals. And then the question was like, why in the world would I rent out my living room to some random stranger to come stay at? And here, here we are, right? Multi-billion dollar publicly traded company, category creating company. But that's a period that is very difficult for companies that are essentially in this category creation phase. Um, so there, there was a company, or there, there is, if you want to still call it that, uh, there's a company called Seamless um, mm-hmm. back in the day, which now is part of Grubhub, that originally pioneered food at the office kind of digitization of that, right? So they went and signed up a bunch of law firms and a bunch of investment banks and suddenly became such a household name. And then they merged with Grubhub, you know, not the, you know, about a decade or so ago. That company is the one that I remember using back in my banking days, my investment banking days, because you stay late at the office all the time and you get a meal stipend. So you order your meal through that platform. And and uh, I remember seeing that and wondering, like, there's a way better way to do this. And so there are these observations that sort of, you know, you you, you take away from seeing that being a customer, talking to administrators, talking to restaurants, and then you realize like nobody likes this company. Why does, why does it still remain in business? Mm-hmm. And so I remember in the early years, like I pr- probably approached 300 plus different investors. Probably I stopped tracking after the first two, 300, <laughs> but um, every single person, you know, they did the whole like, let me know how I can be helpful, but like yeah. they weren't investing. Thanks, but no thanks. Yeah. Thanks, but no thanks. That's like the the VC talk of like, get out of my office, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and 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 I remember being so frustrated because I was like, look, I, I don't understand. I'm trying to do something life changing for the country. Uh, we're trying to do something just that that's going to materially, you know. There's this old saying. I, I don't know who it's attributed to, but like one tried and tested way of creating wealth for yourself is uh, to be, number one, non-consensus correct, non-consensus right. And then number two, to give people what they've always wanted, but don't yet know how to get at scale. And I really felt that like what we were building at ShareBite checked both of those boxes like in a material manner, right? So I, I, I remember being confused. So I was like, maybe I'm the problem, right? <laughs> I like, I mean, that's always, I, I always yeah. make myself the problem. So like, I'm like, I'm not communicating this properly. Can we talk, can we talk again? Nope. And the the recurring theme was, listen, man, I've had like 20 of you show up in the past few years and tell me that they're going to go build the next quote unquote seamless. Mm-hmm. And I haven't heard from them again. And these are like, whatever, right? smart people like Ivy League, whatever, MIT, whatever, they've never been successful. So like, ah, you know, I, I like you a lot. You got a great, you know, background and story and, you know, that your near-death experience is crazy, but um, let's stay in touch. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I remember scrounging together like really, really small checks from whoever would listen to me <laughs> um, back then. And I, I don't even think, they all thought I was a bit crazy because, and some of them are open to telling me that nowadays because they're like, wait a second, you're going to go get every worker in America fed. All right, I'll throw you a check, but it's not going to be big. So we took all these like small checks and scrounged together whatever cash that I was able to put together back then and started building this thing with this mission and focus. The mission is what dictate, dictated the business, right? Uh, oftentimes, you know, you hear from companies that they're mission driven, but it's the business that typically dictates the mission, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to be the best so-and-so. But for us, it was like not just a mission as a company, it's a broader societal mission. It's it's what's best for the country. It's best. What's good for ShareBite is good for every worker in America. If I'm right about this, if we're right about this as a company, we do all right. But like we have this unique opportunity to redefine not only this entire category, define and then redefine, but materially impact not only every worker in America, but their families, right? Because if you you take a cross-section, I mean, there's 44 million uh, Americans that report being food insecure. That's like a 
devastating number. And then the uh, there's this other unreported or underreported number because of the stigma associated with, with saying like, hey, I'm hungry. Mm-hmm. The numbers probably double that, you know, multiples of that. And we, we will never know. Food insecurity tends to become this like, you know, political tennis or whatever pickleball nowadays, right? A political pick, pickleball where it's kind <laughs> of, um, uh, uh, it's like, well, it's that guy's fault, right? Uh-huh. And I know it's this guy's fault, this person's fault. And so you've got uh, the political institutions in the country, one attempting to, if they got hold of it, attempting to make this into a government program. And, and another that is uh, unwilling to acknowledge that the problem even exists. And, and the thing is, like, it doesn't have to be partisan or bipartisan. or not. It's, This is a nonpartisan. This is something that impacts every kind of person, every state, no matter who they vote for, where they typically tend to vote. Like, food insecurity is a national security problem. And if we don't solve that today, it's going to be devastating for the next decade or so. And I guess the larger point is that this idea of food insecurity doesn't go away just because people were sent home during the pandemic. Oh, yeah. It got worse. How did the company kind of transition over that period? It was interesting because we built this, the, the, the software and, and, the, and the, the platform behind it. And we started to get some early successes starting in 2018, right? We started winning these like major, major enterprise customers, Vault 50 law firms, you know, private equity firms, hedge funds, investment banks. The business is doing really well. Business is going great, you know. We're coming into the office, high-fiving each other. It was like a party because, like, last week was our best week ever. And, Mm -hmm. by the way, this last week was our best week ever. So, like, in the company's history. So, that used to be sort of the cadence, right? Every day, every week felt like, wow, we're hitting new highs, new customers. We had a backlog of customers waiting to be onboarded. And then this pandemic hits. Not even just a few weeks later. I mean, I remember closing up that office on March 12th and looking around saying, something tells me I'm not going to see this place again. And that's what happened, right? So we sent everybody home. And then mm-hmm. that Monday, that upcoming Monday was was the first day of the lockdown. The first week, we didn't see as much of an impact, right? I think other people were a bit delayed. Our customers were delayed in sending their workers home. But then the following weeks, business literally went to zero. And then a couple of weeks later, I started getting, you know, emails and phone calls from customers first. I'll never forget these things because, you know, on March 16th, the first day of the lockdown, while everybody else was kind of like figuring out how to survive, how are we going to do this? Our team, the first thing that we did was we reached out to restaurants, as you know, um, we told them, hey, look, we don't know what the world's going to look like, but we're not going to charge you anything. Mm-hmm. Right. So whatever transactions come through, we'll just we'll just send it over to you. Right. Um, just to support small businesses in, in a time of crisis. Then I started, you know, calling up some of our largest customers and saying, "Hey, it's time of crisis. How are you all doing? How are you managing?" And then you start. We started to hear like, "Hey, we're all fine, thankfully, but we want to. Are you guys doing anything to help first responders and frontline staff? We want to help." And you, you know that story from a few years ago. So yeah, so our business had gone to zero. So, but what we started to do was pump all of this volume to restaurants for free, mm-hmm. and 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 they were doing these large, large cater. They were they were helping cater to like first responders. Correct. Through yeah. the uh, ShareBite platform. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So we were just donating our platform or technology um, for the restaurants to kind of communicate with the hospitals and the. Got it. the frontline staff. And I remember getting a call from one investor in particular, well-intentioned, of course, but uh, in on April 6th of 2020, I remember every day. I think that was the day that CARES Act came out. Yeah, I, was it? I, was it? Well, that might have been also been the day that the CARE Act ran out of money. But that's, I, I remember April 6th being a very significant okay. day. Okay. Yeah. So April 6th is the day I got the call from this investor and basically was like, hey, how are you doing? But mm-hmm. then like didn't allow me to even respond. Is like, hey, I, I got to run. But like really quickly, you should f- fire and furlough everybody for that feedback. I don't think that's the right move for us. On April 7th, I ended up having a call with the team. It was a Zoom call. And I remember seeing these like flushed faces on, on, you know, on that call. 
wondering like this is if this was it because mm-hmm. you know you, you see volume has the only volume that we're doing is a pro bono work and i remember telling people like i've taken a zero salary just so you all know the management team has also reduced their salaries we've been hit by a tsunami we need to rebuild we're going to bet on ourselves because there's a team worth betting on all day long there's a very vulnerable open conversation and, and i remember saying like we're going to get through this together. We're going to stick stick through this. Everybody has a job. This is a team worth betting on. So all that I ask of you is that you prove me right. <laughs> and man, this team got to work. And um, going back to that period, and then, you know, left New York, moved into my in-law's basement in Louisville, Kentucky. And remember sitting down with our engineering team being like, we're going to, we're going to accelerate our product roadmap. Mm-hmm. And there was these like crazy ideas in collecting cobwebs in our product roadmap. And we're going to build every one of those. And so by September, the business had not only come back because now, you know, companies were starting to kind of like come back. Like WeWork was one, one example where they were like, whatever we got to do to bring employees back. Mm-hmm. Hey, is food going to do it? Okay, let's, we'll try anything. So they took a shot and then you started to see other companies start to follow follow suit. They were using ShareBite to convince people to come back to the office. Yes. So that was the inkling for us. We're like, wow, that's a that's a mechanism. So suddenly restaurants that had had closed up their locations suddenly were getting 75, 90, 100 transactions all in one order. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're like, hey, how do I do this every day? Because I'm going to open up a location <laughs> for you. All right, let's stop here for a minute. (laughs) Return to office remains a big point of contention um, between, you know, founders or CEOs and their workers. Um, You know, Amazon just announced that its offices will be back to five days a week this next year. Do you think this really, like a meal program, really makes a difference for workers? Absolutely. Okay, tell me me what you think here. Like, because I feel like... It's a nice to have, but it wouldn't get me to come in necessarily just knowing that I had a free lunch. Well, I mean, it's probably not going to work for everybody, but um, in many instances in the ShareBite experience, it, it has worked. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just like an extra incentive. So there's all this big bosses are sitting there thinking like, they're how can I get my workers back in? <laughs> I mean, there's a carrot and a stick approach. Yeah. This is, this is the carrot approach. The stick approach is, you know, a lot more onerous. So I'd rather have the carrot approach. You know, yes, feed me and maybe I'll come in. So give me a reason to come in. And I think that, you know, ShareBite kind of presents that for a lot of, a lot of companies. Yeah. And I think it does give a f- company kind of a feeling of, oh, I'm playing with the big guys, right? Everyone knows Google has free lunch, right? Like, wouldn't you want to be like that if you're a scrappy tech startup? Yeah, absolutely. The more you can level the playing field, the better. Yeah, absolutely. So so returning to Dalip, he was describing how he was getting turned down so much when he was starting the company. How did he turn that around? Well, like many founders, Dalip has the type of personality that can sustain all those rejections. You know, and they pushed through the challenges of starting a business. But his path getting there was unique. When we come back, I'll talk to Dalip about how his entrepreneurial journey started. But first, a quick break. You built your business from the ground up. Now, let's make sure it takes off. With Salesforce, companies of every size can create the best customer experiences. Start with CRM Fast and scale confidently with the marketing, sales, service, and commerce tools that'll grow with you. Learn more at salesforce.com SMB. Entrepreneurship is one of those things where the more of these that you get to meet, Mm -hmm. you'll get the sense that they've been through some crazy things in life. Because, you know, building a company as an entrepreneur, it's a lonely path. And then if you're a founder CEO, it gets even lonelier because um, there are very few people that understand the challenges. Yeah, people people don't necessarily understand everything that you're going through. Correct. Yeah. And it's tough to explain. And so you just kind of, it becomes very lonely and insular and kind of got to talk to yourself in the mirror sometimes, you know, it's, <laughs> I, I, I think other founder CEOs listening, um, 
would probably be like nodding their heads right now. Yeah. For me, the entrepreneurial journey actually started at a very young age. I think first business attempt that I had was in the fourth grade because I kept asking my parents for a Nintendo. My dad, for whatever he could afford at the time, just thought any game, video game would do. So he bought me an Atari 7800. Hmm. I loved that thing for like a month. And then everyone else had a Nintendo. Okay. So I kept asking, oh, I want a Nintendo. And I f- finally gave up. But um, so there's a classmate of mine who had a Nintendo. So I made it a point to go to his house, right? So it was like, hey, I'm going to go to his house. I'm going to do homework there. But selfishly, I would, I'd finish my homework quickly just so I could play you know, Super Mario Brothers with them or any any other Contra, you know, mm-hmm. uh, 80s kid stuff, you know. And then uh, I got this like a harebrained idea that like, what if I played this video game at my house? And, you know, uh, and my mom would, uh, so I asked my mom, can I have friends over? She's like, oh, sure, I'll make some snacks for them, right? So these Indian, she made these Indian snacks. And then, uh, so I went to, you know, uh, his house, and my friend's house and said, asked his mom if I could borrow the Nintendo and play it at my house. And uh, anyway, the, the the short of it is that I invited literally every kid from my class <laughs> into this like small, smallish basement that we lived in in Queens, New York. And uh, I charged them all like, you know, a quarter, <laughs> 50 cents to get inside. Um, and I did that a couple of times. And then I gave that money to my mom, thinking that she would feel proud, except she was scared. Late 80s in, the, in New York City wasn't exactly a safe or great time to kind of live there. And so she thought I was kind of getting into the wrong crowd. So oh, she's like, where'd right. you get this money from? And I go, I'm running a business. She goes, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> so she shuts my business down. Uh, and she goes, no more friends at home. All right. And, and like, no more video games. <laughs> the regulator clamped down. I love it. Yeah, yeah my, my first failure, right? Yeah, exactly. The regulator came down. I had other things like that, right? Uh, throughout the years, I sold computer parts in high school. I don't know what kind of trust my parents had in me, but they dropped me to this this guy's house at like 5 a.m. I'd get in a truck with him and drive out to like King of Prussia to do a trade show. And the guy would pay me, you know, a couple of bucks to kind of like just go with him, lift boxes, sell mm-hmm. parts, and then drop me off at like eight, nine o'clock at night. <laughs> right? So we do these day trips. So always very entrepreneurial, all because I never wanted to be an inconvenience to my parents financially. We didn't have much. I used to say, like, I grew up with nothing. And, like, that's actually a patently false statement because, like, I only meant that from a financial standpoint. But Yeah, like the material things, right? Material things. Yeah. But I, I look back at my childhood, like, we didn't have much, but we were so happy. We were so grateful to be here, right? And and so I used to I used to say that. So I think it's a patently false statement that I grew up with nothing because I grew up with a tremendous amount of wealth, but it came in the form of two parents. Well, right. So why would you why would you pursue a business knowing that you're you know it's a risk to start a business? Yeah, you're getting into the whole Indian upbringing too because growing up you're always we were always told you really have three choices in life: engineer, doctor, failure. Oh, no. Now the, you know, uh, aperture is widened quite a bit, right? So, you know, uh, but that, that was, those were the choices growing up early mm-hmm. on, right? And it, they weren't like hard choices. It was just like, my parents were always like very soft on that. So they would say, it would be nice if you became an engineer. So yes, yeah, so I went and checked the box. I studied engineering. I didn't appreciate it for what it really taught me how to see the world until many years later, until building ShareBite. Right. Risk-taking from that standpoint Growing up, it was like we already took the biggest risk that we could, which is coming to this country and leaving behind everything that we had in India. So now don't take any more risks. Right Now <laughs> just like do the incremental stuff, right? Go get an education, study hard. Don't worry about any household related worries. And um, that type of upbringing makes you kind of risk averse. So when every time, you, you know, my parent, my mom at least saw that I was taking these risks, it was like clamp down, right? Regulators saying no more. So my only choice at the time was like, okay, well, I'm going to just check the box and do what you say, go study engineering. Didn't really have my heart in it, but I did it anyway. But I always wanted to be in business. And so 
the circumstance uh, what really led to me even getting a job and on Wall Street because even back then I, I I didn't really belong on Wall Street because the typical path is you get recruited out of a target school in undergrad or you know somebody in it you mm-hmm. get an internship and then you get invited back for a full time offer I didn't do any of that right so I walked in through sort of the back door interviewing at Goldman Sachs as like a temp as what they call a contingent worker. So my view was, it was very simple. My parents made a lot of sacrifices for me growing up and my sister. And uh, when my dad lost his job about 17 years ago, we were thrust into a financial, like, you know, there was a lot of financial burden, right? So there's, and I had to step up literally overnight and become sort of the head of household. And um, I didn't have anything, right? I, I didn't have any direction on where I wanted to go, right? There's a recent quote that I was reading, like, if you don't know where you're going, any path will do. But I was always very ambitious, Mm -hmm. but I just didn't know which direction to go. I just knew I wanted to be in business or learn about business. So when my dad lost his job and the company he worked for went away, that to me was like the reality, not only check, but like complete like slap across the face where it's like, wake up. Mm -hmm. you've lived under this like false pretense of like financial security for no reason. Now, look, you have to be the head of household and go take care of your parents. And that was the reality check for me where it's like, it was the kick in the behind where I now need to take care of my parents. They made these sacrifices for me. I'm not going to let them down. So I was willing to do whatever. Well, yeah. I mean, you mentioned a near-death experience earlier in our conversation. So what, what happened there? Yeah, so fast forward um, 10 years ago, 2014, after all these challenges, you know, the first five years of my working career, I literally saved up every dollar that I made to make sure that I took care of my parents. I used to beat myself up being like, well, I don't have anything to show for the first nearly five years of my work, but I did, which was a smile on their faces and a roof over their heads and not a single worry on, in the world. So life was going really well. Got married, moved to LA, had just come back. And, you know, in banking, when you have mentors and sponsors like the ones that I did, that was grateful and very fortunate to have had, you know, every couple of years you get this opportunity to leave and go join private equity or, you know, a venture of a hedge fund, you know, well, every time I had the opportunity to leave, somebody at the bank would say, hey, you want to come work for me? Come back to New York, come do this. And so I got invited back from LA back to New York. And a few months afterward, this is in early to mid 2014, a few months in, if Diana, if you had asked me on July 4th of 2014, tell me about your life, couldn't have been better, mm-hmm. right? I was happy, loving it. Like what a privilege, what a, how grateful am I? Like overcome all of these challenges, you know, financial and existent, all these other things, set my family up for success. They don't have to worry about money. And then a day later, on July 5th, 2014, I'm crossing the street, going to the gym, minding my own business. I have a walk sign, I'm on the crosswalk, it's a quiet Saturday morning, and an 87-year-old comes speeding down 54th Street and then and then turns onto Second Avenue. And you know, I have a, a lot to say about New York City traffic. Yeah. A walk sign is not a walk sign, public service announcement. It <laughs> oh, literally no. means dodge traffic. I get hit by a car, my head goes through the windshield. I go flying off the car and I got taken to the hospital Mm -hmm. and I wake up at the hospital and I can't feel anything from the neck down. It's like, I can't move my arms. I can't move my limbs. And I start to go through the the worst case scenarios in my head. And so I, I remember, you know, life is too short. I'd heard life is short, but like, this is crazy. You know, I had much more to go. I had more time left. And then you get into like all these other higher order kind of things where it's like, well, What's my life worth? What purpose have I served? What problem Mm -hmm. in society have I helped solve? What am I worth? Like, not like from a financial sense, but like what, like in in Indian philosophy and tradition, it's like kind of beaten into you in a nice way from a very young age to be useful, to make Mm -hmm. yourself useful. Right. But suddenly if you're, if you're not able to use your limbs, for instance, how are you being useful? Yeah. Exactly. And so I remember saying to my wife and then the nurse at the time, like, hey, this has been fun. I don't want to live 
like this, if mm-hmm. this is how I'm going to be, if I'm going to be incapable from the neck down, I don't, I don't want to live. I reflected quite a bit on that moment this year in particular, because this July 5th was the 10 year anniversary of that. And I, and I didn't think I'd make 10 minutes after that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when, when you have this second, third, I don't know how many chances at life I've gotten, but this one was, a, was different from all the other difficulties that I've faced in life because this was physical. Like I may not be able to move. Yeah. I may not have my sort of the faculties that I tend to take for granted every single day. So yeah, so this is one of those things where it's like, if I got another chance to live a normal life and do the things that I tend to take for granted, I'm not sure what I'll do, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna try to figure out something. And to me, I always knew that building a company that strives for to be a force multiplier for good things, right, societally, it's something that I was always excited about. Every company that I'd saw, there, there have been companies that have been popping up here and there, Patagonia being one, yeah. Maury Parker, et cetera, like where they had one thing that they wanted to kind of go and accomplish. Maury Parker is one, one of those examples. You know, you buy a pair and you give a pair. Someone else who needs, yeah, you give a pair. Yeah. But what, what I realized is when you start talking to people that buy the eye, eyeglass, they're not really thinking about the impact. Sure, it feels good at the time of purchase, but like not the second year that you're wearing the glass, you're not putting those things on and thinking like, ah, this pair donated, to, you know, one to <laughs> one in need. Not saying any, there's anything wrong with it, right? I tr- mm-hmm. truly admire the company, big fan. But I said, you know, the thing about food is that it's a consumable, you, you do it all the time. And if you marry that with this like permission and purpose, like there's something really important that we can go and accomplish. And it's a, it's an experiment. Let's see if it works. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so you knew at that time you, you wanted a deeper meaning in your life. Exactly. And I'd be lying if I said, you know, I thought about the business that is shared by today, but I, I certainly thought about the mission, the really the purpose of helping align the incentives for the private sector to undertake the burden of public good is something that's very near and dear to me. Right. And, I don't think I'll ever start another company again, but if I was crazy (laughs) enough to do it, because, you know, there's still so much more to go here. But if I were ever to start anything else, like I I don't see any other way to build a business, Mm -hmm. right? A business has to be built for the public good. It has to be built for the country. And so suddenly nowadays, it gives me a lot of pride and a deeper meaning seeing a lot of other entrepreneurs saying, hey, I'm building a company for the betterment of the country. Wow. What I loved about your, I mean, I love your story, first of all, and I'm so grateful for you to, for sharing it with, the, with me and our audience. Thank you. When you, you had a LinkedIn post, in your LinkedIn post about the Inc. 5000 announcement of your company, you had this line in there that I just, it, it just like stopped me in my tracks. And I think it sort of speaks to your own experience of having this near-death experience. And I feel like people, it might resonate with people. So the idea, the line was, picture yourself dead. Mm, Think of yourself as dead. Think of yourself as dead, yeah. Tell me about that line and what do you want people to learn from hearing your experience and sort of thinking about that line? I'll share this. That line I shared, it's Marcus, or it's attributed to Marcus Aurelius. I feel like that line is like written on my forehead when I look in the mirror Mm -hmm. every single day. And, you know, I really believe that the problems that we all face as human beings comes from the baggage of yesterday that we carry with us. And, uh, you know, if you you read Stoic philosophy or even Buddhist philosophy or any of the Eastern stuff, like I recently started getting into Vedanta, which uh, my only regret is that I didn't discover this wisdom sooner in life. And uh, you start to realize that, like, we're literally carrying around a dead corpse. Mm. And um, all of the problems that we face or we think we face, I mean, think about it. The problems that you probably thought were, like, the most pressing and most existential of your life 10 years ago or 20 years ago or in high school, it's, like, easy stuff nowadays. Mm -hmm. That's life. It's not that the problems get any easier. You just get stronger. You know how to deal with those things. That quote of think of yourself as dead, you have lived your life 
now take what's left of it and live the rest of your life. And, you know, I get emotional thinking about that quote because that is applicable to everybody's life at every moment of the day. Mm -hmm. If you're going through a difficult period in life, remember that quote because, you know, life is so precious and it takes for somebody like me who has gone through these, this like near death experience and an existential one at that to look back and go, wow, I, I really stared the end right in the face. And then there's this, this thing that pulled me away from it. Mm -hmm. And so this gratitude for not only this life, but being alive, right? There's very few times in life where I have ever felt that alive, right? I, like when I got feeling back in my body later that day after my car accident, I was like, man, I, I can't move, but uh, I feel invincible for, for a hot second. That's like superpowers. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's only it's only people who've been through that type of stuff will, will agree that they have also felt this way. I, mm -hmm. You know, it was a, to me, I had an out of body experience, to be honest. So anyway, the, the, that Stoic philosophy, uh, that quote that I posted about Marcus Aurelius, was truly the one of the first things that I remember reading coming back because I started reading a lot and because you know after a concussion, you know, doctors tell you you can't be overstimulated, don't look at screens. <laughs> Which is Stoic like philosophy is yeah, the, perf so the like perfect I, thing to do. <laughs> I dusted off my old sort of books, philosophy books and stuff that I yeah. never, I hadn't read in a long, long time. And I started reading and I started writing a lot. This summer, I actually went back and read a lot of the stuff. I lost one of the, the notebooks I used to have, mm -hmm. but I have other, other smaller sort of notes and notebooks. But that main notebook, the way I jotted down, like immediately after my car accident, my wife gave that to me because... That was my only outlet at the time, right? I felt alone. I felt like no one understood following the, the concussion. And it was, my brain was going through a healing process. So some pages are, have like some incredibly heartfelt and emotional and eloquent things in there. Other pages are just angry scribble mm. with like nothing on it. Looking back at those stories and the things that I wrote to myself, the emails I wrote to myself from back then, it goes to show that like the brain is a beautiful thing. You have the ability to rewire your brain in a way where you're, you can go and accomplish anything that you want. Mm -hmm. And so the, the company that we call ShareBite today and the mission behind it, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a miracle, but so are you. So are all of us, right? We have a one in, I read like, one in 400 trillion chance of becoming a fully fertilized egg and then, and then becoming human being, fully formed human being. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of us who are listening to this podcast have defied the odds. We're all miracles. We're all I miracles. And we're sitting around thinking like, oh, we're not capable. We're not good enough. We're not mm -hmm. this enough. We're not that enough. That's because the plaque of the world has built up on you and you're letting other people's opinions dictate what you're truly capable of. And so the person that matters the most is staring at you in the mirror every single day. And but that person could also be your best friend and your worst enemy, mm -hmm. your number one cheerleader, but the, <laughs> your number one hater too. But you have the opportunity to choose who you want to be for yourself before you choose who you want to be for other people every single day. And to me, the path of the recovery path I'm still recovering. <laughs> um, who knows, right? I think building and being an entrepreneur is, is perhaps therapy of sorts uh, of, you know, life's mistakes from the past and, you know, things that I, I'm not like, I wish I did things differently and mistakes that I wish I didn't make. But you get to take all those pieces and create the the biggest thing that you, you've ever been capable of. And, and so, yeah, so philosophically... Uh, Stoic philosophy, Buddhist philosophy, and now Vedanta earlier this year, I've uh, really gotten into it, has made my life that much more fulfilling mm -hmm. and, and realizing that like, I'm not alone here. I have all these dead people <laughs> talking to me <laughs> through their books and, and telling me that like, hey, I went through this too, but like that was right. thousands of years ago. You're in good company. So yeah. So yeah. 
it helps you put things in perspective. It makes you, Absolutely. you know, I, I imagine helps you realize that the the things that you think are really horrendous as you're going through it end up being small in the long run. So, exactly. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Um, Dalib, it's seriously always an education. You know, we should do this more. <laughs> I'd be honored. What a privilege. Thank you for having me on, Diana. Such a such an incredible honor. Well, thank you. After talking to Dalip, I'm left thinking about how his near-death experience changed the way he looks at the world. I looked up the full Marcus Aurelius quote. He mentions toward the end of our conversation, while you live, while it is in your power, be good. Think of yourself as dead. You have lived your life. Now, take what's left and live it properly. This experience that he had didn't just change the way you looked at the world. He decided to actually do something. And he did that by starting a company that both gives back and does something positive for individuals, even if it's just something small, like lunch. That's all for this episode of From the Ground Up. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your podcast platform of choice. Also, if you like this episode or have suggestions of what topics you'd like to hear about, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or reach out to us on Inc. social channels on LinkedIn, X, or Instagram. From the Ground Up is produced by Julia Shu and Avery Miles. Editing by Blake Odom. Mix and sound design by Nicholas Torres. Our executive producer is Josh Christensen. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.